Hi guys, thanks for supporting us. Today is our first session with the online conference and I'm glad to be presenter of this conference uh, because it's the second edition. Unfortunately, it's online, but next year, let's think positive that we are going to have a third physical conference. So this is Lawrence. Hi. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm, uh, my name is Lawrence Corain. I am from Belgium and uh, I currently work for uh, Adobe, working with the uh, Substance suite of tools. And I'm here to, uh, to talk to you guys a bit about the texturing pipeline. Great. So can we start with the presentation? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let me switch to the correct screen and then... Um... All right, is that all working? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, substance pipeline um, and maybe to dig a little bit deeper first into why I'm going to talk about this specifically, a little bit more about me. So to give you my background and why I like to talk about this topic. Um, first, uh, when I started studying over 10 years ago, I was at a school called Digital Arts and Entertainment. Uh, so I was um, a student there, afterwards a teacher. And then when I moved into the industry, I uh, first worked for Splash Damage uh, on a uh, online free-to-play FPS called Dirty Bomb. And that was a good start for me because I, uh, I was a technical artist there, had a really good tech art lead. Uh, his name is Paul. And he got me really into creating tools for people there. So creating things that makes other people's lives easier, trying to find those, those areas where it's boring, where it's slow to do things and create scripts that can get you uh, to creating art quicker. Uh, after Splash Damage, I moved to EA DICE in Stockholm, so they're known from Battlefield, but I worked on uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. And uh, this was an interesting project as well, it was a totally new engine, and we were right at the time when we were switching from uh, old-gen texturing, so uh, diffuse, specular, glossiness, to PBR, so base color and metallic and roughness, that type of thing. And I was also a technical artist there, and this is at that point I came in touch with, uh, with Substance. Uh, my technical art director, he, he basically told me um, there's this really interesting tool. Uh, I want you to look at this. It's called Substance Designer. So this is about seven years ago, I think, so before Painter. I sat down and looked at this, and uh, what I did is um, I... Uh, I, I basically thought this was an amazing tool, and I really got started on my journey of trying to find better ways, faster ways to texture, integrate this into, uh, into pipelines. Um, so maybe a little bit more background. So really what I like to do is work on these tools and, and scripts that uh, help you make, uh, make art. So uh, for example, a script I made before, this was during my internship even, was I had to place containers and I had to build like random stacks with them. And there's rules to this, obviously. Like the stack is 10 containers long, five wide. They're randomly placed. And if there's no container at the bottom, then you can't have floating ones. So I created a script for this. You can see the interface at the right in 3ds Max, and this was creating it for me. And for me, this type of thing where maybe I spend a bit more time on writing the script, but I have actual codes creating the art for me and I can iterate over it, modify it is really something that I really enjoy doing. So making other people's lives easier. And in this case, even it, um, it was one of the most used assets in the game. They basically put whole levels full with these container stacks. And so, well, this was some simple scripting in MaxScript. What I did at DICE is uh, we looked at some, uh, some assets, testing the, the textures, and we had things created in Photoshop at first. And back then it was still a big question, can we get the same quality with Substance? So this is an old image. Um, by now it's, it's long established that you can do this type of thing in Substance, but sitting down and seeing that, okay, we can have a program that generates these things and we don't have to paint everything by hand, putting in photos, you can get the same quality. But this use case was really a good, um, a good starting point for us to get started. So we then sat down and uh, defined a bit of a pipeline. Uh, this was still early days, but uh, it, it was the first project there that used Substance Designer. And we tried to get everything textured with Designer back then. That was hard. Again, there was no painter. So people like character artists said, ah, oh, this doesn't work for us. Um, 
but it was it was a really interesting case and what we really used it a lot for was uh, the building modules and you'll see a bit more about that in the uh, the next image i didn't put any screenshots of the game in since i'm not sure if that's entirely uh, okay but i'll show you some examples uh, afterwards now i keep talking about pipeline and i feel like maybe i should explain this a little bit more at, uh, at first so uh pipeline can be a really abstract term and that is because it is kind of abstract it describes the whole process of creating an asset for your movie, your game, your project from start to finish, basically. Um, so here you can see, I've, I've tried to make a simple graphic that describes this. And a pipeline is basically called like that because you have interchangeable steps, pieces of pipe that form a process. And one process feeds into the next. Sometimes you will return, like uh, for example, you will create a model, UV it, realize your UVs needs to be changed, you go back to the model, or you might UV and export it, do a bake, realize your model needs to change. So there's a back and forth process in here often. Um, and a lot of these steps are, are in, involved. Some of them, it makes sense to automate them. Like for example, exporting, uh, you would automate it baking these days as well. When it comes to painting or UVs, for example, it's been hard uh, historically to, to do this kind of stuff. Now, um, Pipeline is important because when you're making a big project, these processes need to be established. You need to make sure that rules are followed, that things meet the quality requirements. Um, so if you are an upcoming student uh, artist or you've mainly worked as a freelancer, this stuff might be alien to you. But if you work in a studio, this type of thing in serious studios, at least that are well organized, is really super important. And the further that you go into establishing this pipeline, trying to automate it, establish rules, the smoother the process of art creation becomes. Now, um, one thing to point out as well is that when people make 3D, uh, sometimes we like to think ourselves as artisans, you know, like this guy on the, on the left here, where you've, you've honed your skills, you, you're doing your craft, you're very good at it. But in reality, in projects where, where lots of things have to be created, it takes a long time or there's tight deadlines, it's, it's more like this. You're more on an assembly line when you're doing lots of different UVs for different assets, when you have to um, update many different textures, you're fixing your cages for your bakes, it just becomes a bit of a repetitive process. So, and when we think of, of automating things versus manual results, manual results, we imagine it looks amazing because we've handcrafted everything. And with automation, sometimes people have an idea of, oh, we want to stay away from that. Um, this example on the right is from Wikipedia when you search for procedural textures. So people sometimes think if you automate it, I lose that control. But uh, the truth is you need to know a bit of both to really benefit. If you are an artisan that knows how to really craft something that looks amazing, and you also know the steps that are slow and painful and they take a lot of time to do, and you, you're basically repeating monkey work, then you can combine them and you can basically be the guy. You can use automated pipeline tools to boost, accelerate, and turbocharge your work. And I guess everybody wants to be this guy, right? Everybody wants to, wants to have the most streamlined, the best processes, and the best tools to achieve their, uh, their art goals. So that's kind of what, what this is about. Uh, I kind of want to pinpoint that you look for the best of both. If you know how to do something really well by hand, then you want to focus on the parts that make the difference in the art. You don't want to lose time with setting up lots of technical little things, which unfor unfortunately in 3D is still often the, uh, the case. Now, um, you're probably already using some of this. Uh, so if you're using Substance Painter, for example, with smart materials, that's already part automated uh, in there. Um, but what I want to show you in this case is uh, a way to take it really far to combine the best of our tools to create a, a full pipeline. So Let's look at this case, and this is what I really want to uh, dive into. This is uh, based on the work I did back at uh, DICE. We had these building modules that needed to be created. These are some of the some of the reference we actually looked at. And we had to build a whole city full of these building modules. And um, team wasn't very big. You've only got like three, four people doing this, and you have to create hundreds and hundreds of these building modules. And if you're going to texture all of them by hand, one by one, you're going to hand paint all of these little uh, pieces of dirt, all of the, if you're going to hand place all of that, it's just going to take way too much time. So uh, it's a very good case to automate things. Uh, like I said, it doesn't work for everything necessarily. A hero asset that you would see up close, uh, like a first person weapon or a character from a cutscene, wouldn't really make that much sense to go this deep into uh, automating your pipeline. But for a case like this, with lots of objects, definitely makes sense. So um, 
To give you a bit of an overview with some images, it, it involves preparing your data and setting some standards. So when you're making modules like this, we create uh, low polys and high polys. And the high polys have either material IDs or vertex colors assigned. So what we would do is um, you, we'd establish a standard here where we say, for example, red in vertex color and material ID is always going to be wall or plaster. Um, the green is always going to be the metal, blue is always going to be glass, and so forth. Now, people, you often do this when you're creating your own type of art with an ID map, right? If I just create a portfolio project, I might do this too. But the important part here is that across all of the different assets, you always use the same colors. So this could involve um, importing a material library into Max or Maya and picking from that or using a custom script to assign your materials. But you have to make sure that these things are, uh, are standardized. And then um, let's take a look at how this actually works then. So I'm going to jump out of this presentation and we're going to look at my files that I have here specifically. So I've got some stuff open. And uh, first I'll show you a little bit how the, the actual content works. So I've got a few scripts here that are going to automate this process. And I've got a content folder with assets and a substance library folder in there. So the first thing, we've got these high and low poly assets. These are basically the modules. If I look in here, I've got three different sets. The Concho set with two different modules, Kyushu set and Shin set. And all of them contain a, um, a low poly and a high poly bake preset in there. And then, um, so first thing we can do to automate it, I can actually just show you that straight away, is we've used something that uh, it's a product from us called the Substance Automation Toolkit. And what this does is it provides a script access to our tools. So all the baking tools from Substance Designer or from Painter, because those are shared, can be accessed over the command line. So what I'm showing you here is a way that uh, these days you would apply this process in, a, um, in an advanced pipeline. So you have to create a lot of these modules. You don't want to bother too much with the baking. We have a JSON file bake preset that was created. So just to show you what this is, you can see this just basically defines a bunch of maps to, the, to bake, ambient occlusion, um, world space, et cetera. And these were saved from Substance Designer. So if I want to make these maps, I can run this script. You can see it's going to go through all my content asset folders. It creates a bakes folder in here. And it's real-time live, splitting out these bakes automatically on the background. So uh, what this means is that I open up the program and do things manually. Uh, I could just fire off this script. Now, it's important to note that uh, right now I still have to manually create this script. Because we intend this as a pipeline, it's up to you in a studio, in a pipeline, or when you're testing this at home, to implement this yourself uh, as a script. Um, to show you what the script does, it's actually fairly simple. There's some setup info, but essentially what happens at the end here is it's going to call the, um, <coughs> the baker and bake those maps out. So uh, it's using a um, <coughs> PySBS batch tools. This is our Python module and it uses the SPS baker from that. So basically in just a few lines, you can already call this baker and have your bakes done for you. So just to show you, Control one was baked. If I go into O2, I also have my bakes here. And right now I think it's finishing up with the Shinden bake. There we go, bakes. So these are being baked out as well. Then once that's done, uh, you can take those bakes and continue on with them. But the next step that we've done is we've created a, uh, another script, set up the SBS file. So to explain what that actually does is I have to dive into my code a little bit more. Uh, what I've done is I've created some packages and a template to build these textures from. Because what I would like to do is uh, jumpstart and pre-texture my, um, my modules in a, in a quick way. So if I go through the readme that we have here, and go to the bottom. I actually want to go from this image, so this color ID one, to a 70% completed one with just a single script. Um, I'm always repeating the same stuff for these modules, maybe with a few variations, but I don't want to hand paint all this stuff. So that's what this script is going to do for me. So first it needs to create the bakes. And then once I've done that, I can jump in and uh, generate the SPS file. So just to show you, it's going to base it on a template. So if I open up this template file here, just let that open. This is a graph that's been pre-created. Let's just wait until that opens. It's going to take the mesh maps as inputs and then it's preset to generate a full material. 
So uh, it will take this template and generate all the other textures based on that template. So if I close this down and I go into my content folder and run the setup SBS, that one's actually really fast. So if I look in here now, I've now got a Shinden 01 SBS file. So if I go into my assets, Kancho, for example, all of them now have an SBS file that I can open. So if I double click those, you'll see that in Substance Designer, it opens up that file and it's going to be generating my texture here. Just increase the resolution a bit. There we go. So it's taking that same template, fed in the bakes that I made in advanced automatically. So that's what the script did. It took the template, inserted the bakes, and then the template automatically creates my base color, my normal map, and my roughness and everything based on that. Now, you might want to iterate a bit more here. At one point, you might say, OK, you know, I want to see this with the mesh. I might want to redo my bake and edit it a little bit. So the script can do another step for you then. If I go back into my folder here, I can set up the bakers to also work inside Substance Designer. So if I run this one, it does a really quick run through. I can open up the SBS again to go for the next step. Let's just wait for that to open. And what's now happened is my mesh is open. And I can actually rebake. So if I double click on the mesh first, set that to show in 3D, you can already see that this texture has been fully generated just by the script by using the template. And if I now want to iterate over the bakes, I can right click and access the baking in Substance Designer by clicking Bake Model Information. And those same maps that were baked automatically are now available inside the UI of Substance Designer. So I can say, OK, you know what? Um, the ambient occlusion actually didn't like it so much that we uh, didn't have the uh, padding in here. So let me see. We can say Apply Diffusion. And then we can start the render and go over the bakes again. So it's redoing the bakes for me now, one by one. It's going over those with change settings. So again, you can do it automatically by running the script, or once you run a few extra scripts, you can do them inside uh, Substance Designer by just manually adding onto them. Another step that I can do in here as well is I might want to start tweaking this a little bit. So I might not be completely happy with the way this looks, or I might want to introduce some variation. So these graphs have parameters, which have been exposed in advance. So if I click here and go to preview, then you can see that this graph has quite a few presets that I can go over. So for example, uh, right now, this glass is quite, uh, quite dirty. So you can see that there's uh, dirt running over here. If I open up the glass settings and, for example, reduce that dry streaks effect, like so, and uh, maybe reduce those dirt drips, I can make that glass cleaner. And so I can reduce those, play with that. And if I go into the presets, I can even completely start changing this. So let's say I would want to create a clean version out of this that's completely different. So in wall, for example, I'm going to turn down dirt amount, set that over there. Uh, let's say I want to use tiles on here. And we want to not randomize the scale too much, maybe a little bit like that. And let's see anything else that we're going to set up. Maybe add some more grunge to the roughness of those tiles to create a completely different version. Uh, so maybe let's reduce the rust on the metal as well. Let's go into metal one and reduce the rust spreading. So once I'm happy with this preset, I can uh, give it a name. So let's call this one uh, clean tiles and make a new preset out of that. So right now this preset is inside the file and I can always go back to default settings, change it like that. I'm happy with that. Uh, and I might want to generate some variations of this or even get this into the engine. So once I'm happy, I can save the SPS file out. So that concludes one step of manual editing. I'm going to close this and we're going to jump back to our script. And if we want to take this to other applications, into our game engine or into Sub Painter to continue, we need another file type. So this SPS file can only be opened inside um, Substance Designer, but to go to Painter, we need to generate another one. So we run an extra script for that, cook SBSAR. Once that's running, we give it some time. And you can see right now, a SBSAR file appears here that we can use inside uh, other applications. And this becomes a, a small portable file that contains all the um, actual bake maps in there as well. And it's also doing all the other ones. So right now it's the last one, Shinden. We'll just wait for it to complete. 
And at this point, you can take this into your game engine. You can also start rendering the textures. So uh, the ones that we've created, we can actually already start outputting them automatically. So we'll click Render Textures. It's going to start going over that. And you see it's just created the Textures folder here. If I open that up, it creates a folder for the default settings in here. And it's going to start rendering the uh, textures that appear in here. So this one might take a while. I'm not sure if I'm going to completely let this complete. Because um, for a live stream, it takes a little bit longer to, uh, to go through that. But it will generate all the textures. And the idea is that for every preset that I have, it is going to also generate a folder with the presets. So remember those clean tiles I made? I'm also going to get those textures uh, dumped out in here. Um, so it looks like this one is going to take a while. So I'm actually going to kill that process. And we're going to jump ahead uh, and continue a bit further. So this would be the mostly automated process where I've baked the maps, I've gone into the SBS, I um, modified it a little bit, I've cooked it, and then rendered the textures. I can continue from there. But you might also want to take this into Painter and paint on it a little bit there. And this is actually, these days, probably the preferred way. You do about 70% automated, and the final touch-ups you would do in Painter. So I can have another script for that, and th this is going to export it specifically for Painter, so as a Painter filter. Go so over them, you can see it creates a, a SP filter, SPSCR here. And then uh, we've gone a bit further even. We created a script to generate a uh, painter startup script. And um, just to remind you so far, all this rendering, cooking, everything, that's all the substance automation tools uh, that are doing this. So these are again, Python scripts of everything fits within the single screen view. So one page of code of which about half of it is, is probably essential. And this uh, startup script, this is the last one, really easy, generates a shortcut to launch painter with uh, this project. So if I double click that, Painter will be started, and my project will be open. And with just a few more steps, I can then start painting on it and continue from that auto-generated result. Here comes Substance Painter. That's the mesh I was just working with. And in the texture set settings, you can see that the bakes are loaded. If I now want to bring in the results that I just did before, I've got this SP filter SPSAR. Unfortunately, this can't be scripted yet, but we're working on this to uh, also automate this step. Bring it in as a filter for the project. Click Import. If I go to my layers, I can take the one I just imported, drop it in, and it generates those textures for me just as it did before Painter. Uh, I just have to change one thing here, set this to replace. There we go. That fixes the normal maps. And just to show you all the stuff I did before, remember that preset for the tiles, it's also in here. So anything I did in Designer is automatically brought over to Painter. So if I click that, they see that's that preset I did before. And if I want to start messing with it again, say I want to bring back that dirt, I can, of course, do that here. So change this. And I can then, of course, just continue with this and bring in any smart materials that I might want to. So if I create, for example, a fill layer in here, and uh, let's set that one up to be a bit dark and dirty. If we add a mask, and to that mask, we can then just start doing things like adding generators, dirt, and so forth. Let's see, let's throw this dirt on. So uh, same type of stuff as you do usually is possible, but starting on from that automatic work from designer, brought into Painter for you to complete and then export as textures before. Um, so to jump back to that uh, pipeline example I had here, so essentially what we're doing is all the ones that are colored in red, so the baking, creating a template, auto texture, paint, export, all of those are going to be automated. At any point, I can jump between them, and I still have manual control over them to override them. So it doesn't become completely automated. You're not replaced by a robot, but your tools and your workflow are turbocharged by, by making use of the automation possibilities of uh, Substance tools. Um, so I think that's mostly it on how um, this sort of pipeline was set up. So just to maybe repeat a little bit, um, what's happening here is we've got a specific setup where assets are predefined, and we've got scripts that each of them are optional. You can do each of them manually, but when you use them all together, um, it can really help you create your art in a much quicker way. I don't want to bother too much with baking, uh, exporting your textures, rendering them. That's just boring as well. So when you can use scripts for that and still have that manual control with ending up in Painter, 
just makes things much uh, much easier for you. And then to go back to my presentation, so uh, this was a, a demo that me and a coworker called uh, Andrea Marchizo have uh, worked on. Uh, this isn't released publicly yet, um, but on the docs for uh, the substance automation tools, you can already find some examples. Um, but to give you an example where this was used um, professionally, so let me just go back into presentation mode. So this was uh, about three years ago, um, Creative Assembly in uh, Horsham in the UK. They made Halo Wars 2, and they, uh, they actually put some information online about how they use our tool. Uh, to do this. So this is uh, Halo Wars is um, an RTS. So it's top down. Uh, you see lots of small little units and they've got lots of variations and different colors. And they created a tool which is based on our substance automation toolkit, but they've created their own UI for this. So this is not something that's commercially available. No, they've decided we're going to build a tool called Substance Center where you can choose your low poly, your high poly a template file. It's going to bake those mesh maps. It shows you the outputs. So this is basically what I've just shown you, but with a lot more work into it specifically for the pipeline of, of Halo Wars. So what that meant is that uh, assets like this, with different variations, could be generated fairly quickly because in advance when creating the high polys, uh, this artist set up his, uh, his ID colors. He made use of a predefined library of materials and uh, could then just quickly generate these and eventually finish them up by painting over them in Painter. And I remember they said something like um, the auto-generated stuff, in some cases, was actually absolutely fine for what it was. It's just a small thing on the screen. There wasn't even any need to go any further and, uh, and, and paint over that. When it's for certain projects, like an RTS with small units, smaller on, on the screen, you don't even have to put all that effort into it to uh, to create them. So they could be more efficient, iterate quicker, and create their art quicker, and not have to bother with uh, the the boring parts. Um, so that's about it for my presentation. Um, I maybe I went a bit fast over certain parts. Um, I'm going to be available to answer questions, obviously. Uh, Stefan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I can go back and show any part that people might be might be interested uh, in. Yes, if, if the presentation is uh, finished, then we can continue to the chat room. Yeah, sure, we can, uh, we can do that. Shall I stop sharing my screen then? Yes, definitely, we're going with, with break. Yeah, okay. Can you uh, volume down the Twitch? Okay, so I have a question. I have a question. Uh, how did you get involved in the industry? Well, for me, it started with I was in architecture school. I was modding video games back when it was uh, kind of easy to do that. And I was creating cars for a game I was playing at the time. And I, I got so into it and they taught us some 3ds Max that I realized, okay, I, I want to do this uh, for a living. And then I went to a university in Belgium called um, Ho West in the course is DAE, so Digital Arts and Entertainment. That was a really good way to get started. Um, I'm actually still quite happy with that school. I mean, I, I taught there for a while. They've actually even been elected as, uh, I think last year, as one of the top three game schools in the, in the world. And they gave you an internship there, uh, which was in container script. And uh, after that, I, uh, I actually got my first job because I was creating tools in my spare time already. I wrote a um, viewport shader for 3ds Max uh, called the Xolial shader from my, my nickname at the time. And I posted this on a forum called uh, Polycount. And uh, people saw that there. And the people from Splash Damage actually contacted me on Polycount saying, hey, we're looking for a tech artist. Uh, are you interested? And that's how I got my first job eventually. So for me, it was um, 
Interest before, modding video games, just figuring it out myself, uh, lots of tutorials, lots of head scratching and problems, and going to a good school that really got me started with a good internship. And then uh, finally as well, putting your name out there online by just creating art, creating tools, making something that, that people, uh, people use and like. Um, and that's, that's what got me noticed and got me my uh, first job, uh, actually. Nice. Some of the audience saw and recognized your shader, so that's great. Uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, uh, why is it important to model and texture a realistic rock? Uh, I think anything that seems hard to make a good uh, good art, 3D art out of, you, you need to look at more reference and more just try and understand what actually makes it work. So remember when I said about that thing where you want to be an artisan, but you also want to automate things? Becoming a pro and really studying how something works, why something looks good, looking at references, repeating, that's just going to be key to it. If you find something's impossible, it's probably just going to take more looking at reference, more trying to understand what it takes and just practice, really. Great, great. As well, we have seen in the chat that Nicola Damianov, the lead artist from Nortus, has... Uh... Hi, Nicola. <laughs> it's, it's great to see Nicola. Uh, one more question. Uh, what's the beginner, uh, beginner's mistake? Beginner's mistake. Uh, I like to hammer on reference. I would say beginner's mistake is not looking at enough reference. Um, and some people are very creative and they can just create something boom like that from the top of their mind. But very often when you're creating 3D art, people want to have some kind of recognizable semblance of realism in there. So looking at reference, trying to find what really works. I actually wrote an article about this on my website ages ago, but it's, it's still true. That's kind of what's key. So somebody might start modeling a car but they don't look close enough at reference and they're missing the fact that how smooth a curve is, what the exact bevel of something is. And in the end, when you ignore too many of these little details, too, too many details in the reference, your, your end result is just going to look off. It's not going to look realistic. And I think that's one of the key beginner mistakes. It goes with everything, with modeling, with texture, look at reference, try to understand what's important that makes it realistic and what makes it interesting. And once you understand that, you can recreate it and go further and make it even more uh, interesting. Great. Uh, so we have uh, more questions now from Nick. What's the difference between uh, texturing uh, for games and for movies? It's a really good question. So I, I, I don't come from movies. I... The first thing that's important is for games, you're always balancing performance. Well, for movies, that doesn't really matter much because they have, what, five hours to render a single frame anyway. So for games, you're going to always be considerate of how many different texture sets you're using, what your poly count is, uh, what resolution your textures are. All of that's going to be, um, it's going to be limited. While for movies, a lot of that just goes out of the window. They're more, they're more, they care so much more about the realism and the up-close features, uh, which for games, I mean, you, you can't really do that. In a game, sure, you can you can go stand up with your face against the wall. And um, I remember in some productions, the art director wanted this. Like, I want to run up in the wall and see the details and the specific pieces of sand up close. But you, you just can't do that for video games. Well, for, um, for movies, it's much more of a free-for-all. Um, but there the question is going to be, you still want to stay efficient. If you can make something super, super realistic, you don't want it to take 100 days to make a single asset. right? So there the challenge is more how to get something good looking in the amount of time that you have there, because deadlines are for sure much shorter uh, for movies than they are for, uh, for games, depending which one, but in general, that's, that's true. Great, so I have a question. Uh, what, were, what tips would you give to the audience uh, for starting in this industry? What channels should they follow? And let's say some challenges. Uh, do you mean in general in 3D or with texturing or just to make sure I get it? As well in uh, texturing and general. Uh, I would say, you know, what I like to do these days is look at ArtStation to get inspired. Uh, e either see what the quality level is of people these days, and it's definitely going up uh, much more, or to get inspiration from great concept art. Um, these days, there's a lot of good tutorials as well uh, that you can find. When it comes to Substance specifically, I can vouch for them because I help creating them. So we have Substance Academy, 
really good spot to get started. And uh, in general, even for for things like Blender, there's great channels on YouTube uh, to get started and uh, and to learn that. And um, other than that, uh, I would say try to mod some video games. There's really nothing if you're if you're just starting as a student. There's nothing that replaces actually making something that goes into a video game and, and to see what makes it work. What are like the specific challenges for that? It's just really valuable lesson if you're not uh, if you're not a pro yet. Chris, definitely good advices. And we have uh, one more question uh, for the scripts because uh, what have I've seen it's very easy to bake and uh, procedural texturing and also the templates are awesome. So are the scripts going to be available for the audience or? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're going to make these at, uh, at one point. Uh, you can already go to docs.substance3d.com and click on uh, Substance Automation Toolkit. It's, it's uh, I think, in the middle right. It's a yellow sort of um, sprocket. Uh, if you click on that, you can already read more about the uh, Substance Automation Toolkit. And I see that um, somebody is asking about the Python scripts. So it's, it's using those libraries. What Substance Automation Toolkit is at first, it's a uh, command line accessible uh, tool to bake, to cook, to render your textures, so to do the, the different steps. And then uh, the Python library is a binding of those, um, those command line tools. So you can access them through Python in an easier way, like with basically good functions and autocomplete and that type of thing. So that's what we've, we've used here. And um, the story behind the thing I just showed, I actually made this for a talk I did a while ago, and I spent, I think it was two, three hours to write these scripts. Now, I have some Python experience um, to basically create this from the examples that were on the website. And then my coworker, Andrea, sat down and he uh, helped him a bit, made them a bit cleaner, added features that I missed in the few hours that I had, and that's how we came to this sort of uh, pocket pipeline example that I, uh, I just showed. Um, so that's, that's the idea about it. So... Automation Toolkit is already available. Um, I think it's it's not available for uh, student licenses, though, so it's a bit harder to get into that. But if you really want to get into that, I'm, I'm sure there's a way. Uh, talk to us on the Discord channel or send a, an email to the school, uh, sorry, to the contact email address, and maybe we can figure something out uh, there. Because uh, we want to have more people use this. Uh, to be honest, it's super powerful, but doesn't get used all that much yet. Um, so I hope that's a bit of an answer. Great. So we have more questions. You can answer them directly. Okay. Let me let me read. Um, it's a work in progress software that can make, change jumping from one another in the pipeline. Yeah, that's a good question. You're basically talking about how in the pipeline. So this is from MVFX MM. Going from one in the pipeline to the other. This is whew, it's a difficult one. Um, to be honest, that's just the challenge these days. It's so fragmented. There's different programs that do different things uh, in different ways, and going between them is quite uh, quite hard. There is no real software that makes that easier. If anything, I would say Python, <laughs> because Python can script things for you. If you can script in 3ds Max or Maya to make your things easier to export, and you script in Designer, you can script with Python, and Painter is coming later, uh, you can make that jump between programs much easier. So I'd say learn Python is probably the best answer to that. Or try to stick more to a single application, um, which is hard because you need at least two or three these days. Other than that, there's no ideal solution. I hope us at Adobe Substance that we can solve this one, one day, but uh, we're not there yet. So uh, I see another question from... Um, YT Ellen, uh, modeler working for an animation company. I want to have the ability to do something technical artists do in the future. Um, don't know how to start. I would say, like I said before, learn Python. Um, I know I'm hammering on this, but it's it's the presentation I gave. Uh, I'm not a Python pro by any means, but Python is so easy to get started with, I think, for programming. It's quite easy to do like a Hello World type of program. There's lots of good websites explaining it. The documentation is pretty good too. Um, I think that's a, re a, a good one to get into uh, because Python, again, it works in so many different programs. You can use it in Blender, you can use it in Max, you can use it in Maya, you can use it in Substance Designer, you can use it standalone as well. Um, as a technical artist, knowing Python is really a big, big plus. Uh, it's just, I would almost call it a requirement if you want to be a TA. Um, as someone who wants to start studying 3D modeling and animation, 
to your advice for beginners. Uh, whew, a, either if you're somebody who's good at learning alone, like I've seen, I know somebody personally who sat down for like one year, locked himself in his room and learned it and got a job. <laughs> but you have to be very, very motivated for that. Otherwise, um, I'd say look at tutorials, set yourself goals, try to specialize a bit as well. A big mistake beginners make is they want to do everything. They want to make an entire environment with a super realistic character. Start small, focus on doing these small things well before you try and expand into something big. And if you have trouble learning by yourself or you feel you're stuck, uh, it's worth considering going to a good, uh, a good school. Um, I don't know what country you're from, but uh, depending on, on where you are, there might be good ones in your, um, your country. Or you could search online for uh, the schools I was talking about, the one that, that I went to. If you search for the rookies, they have a listing of the quality of schools. It's a coworker of mine who does that, and they look at students' um, students' work quality level. And an independent jury ranks schools based on the quality level of students as well. So it's a good one to look at if you want to find where the good schools are. It changes every year. Like the school I went to isn't isn't in the top three anymore, but it depends on what students are coming out there. So that's another uh, tip. Um, Vixer twenty four is asking: Is it complicated to model? Depends, man. It depends on the game. There's no one answer there. It's it's. Uh, it depends on which game you're you're after. To be honest, these days I don't do it anymore. Uh, it's been a long time. But um, the ones on Steam Workshop and the ones that are popular, those are good ones to look at. Uh, like I I know you can mod Dota, for example. They have Steam Workshop for that. If you like that, you can take a look. There's probably lots of tutorials and guides uh, to do it. Uh, the one I modded was. Uh, was much harder back then. You needed lots of custom plugins and scripts from people, um, but it just depends. Some games are very hard. Some companies make it really, really hard to do. They basically hate modding and they just want to sell DLC. Some say, we love modding, please make as much mods for our game as possible. That's kind of the ones you want to, uh, want to go after. So just look at the games you're playing and try to see if there's one that supports it. Uh, Epic Pete is asking, what level of skill is needed to get to get an entry-level job in a studio. Um, yeah, it keeps going up. I would say look at ArtStation, uh, look at some of the good work there, and sometimes you'll see students coming up with a quality level of work. Uh, I'd say that's kind of the level that's required. Obviously, some studios are looking for lower-level stuff, but if you want to get a job at a AAA studio, um, that's kind of the quality you're, you're after. Um, so yeah, I'd say... What you're seeing currently on ArtStation is probably going to be the level these days. It's Back when I was a student, it was much lower, but tools are getting better, graphics are getting better, so requirements are going up. That's not to discourage you, but um, there's, of course, a bar to reach, and there's lots of people trying to get into as well, so just let that be a motivation for you. Um, if I think graphics on a phone will become as good as your in the future, that's hard to say. I don't play that many video games anymore these days. I think we're going to get there probably uh, at that point. Um, if you look at what phone games looked like five years ago compared to now, it's it's getting closer and closer. So uh, I think I think we're definitely going to reach that point. Um, any tips on art direction? What's my experience with it, and what's a good way to keep the art consistent in your game? Uh, I've, so I was never an art director, I was a technical artist, um, but what I would say is um, good concept art, having a vision, having a good collection of reference and style uh, to go to, and uh, also trying to make use of tools and scripts in your pipeline to match something. Also, one tip I can give you if, if you want to stick to this is usually when art direction is established, um, companies or artists will make some kind of benchmark level or asset, like they'll make the main character of the game at, uh, they'll take a long time, but they'll try and reach the quality level they want, learn things along the way, and they'll base all the rest on that. So like, okay, this worked really well. We like this style. We like texturing in this way. We're going to base it on that. Or they'll make a level which is small. They make everything from scratch to try and establish the style and then go from, from there. So um, benchmarking uh, is, is, so you create like a benchmark asset, base yourself on that from then on is what you would do. Um, my thoughts on GTA V, Oof, that's hard to answer. Um, is it going to be hard to make? Yes, but I'm sure they know what they're doing. <laughs> a little about how they're doing things. Um, Rockstar is very secret about how they do it, so I can't really say much about uh, that. 
Yes, but uh, on uh, on 28th March, we're going to have a speaker that work on uh, the Les Geta. Yes, there. <laughs> By the way, awesome questions. Continue. So we have another question. Is Blender going to become some kind of standard? You know, to be honest, that's a very good question. Um, to be honest, I, I hope so. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that, but I hope so. I think this kind of innovation is only better. Um, so I used to work at DICE and we used Maya there. A lot of people from DICE have left to form a new studio called Embark and they are using Blender there. So this is a AAA studio with very experienced people and they're using Blender there. So I think this is going to, it's coming. Like somebody's saying it's it's never going to be an industry standard. I, it might be. Um, the fact that it's open, that you can change it is, is a huge uh, plus. I mean, I remember when we were working at DICE, we had problems with FBX exports from Maya. And we had to get Autodesk to finish this, to fix this. It took a long time to do that. It was just slow. So if you have a tool where you could fix it yourself or expand it easier, it's, it's an advantage. Um, let's see for some more questions. We've got lots coming in. Um, some of the best models I've seen. Uh, that's just going to be the stuff I like on ArtStation. So you can find me on ArtStation as Xolyul, X-O-L-Y-U-L. Um, just in general, I like to look at the weapons and vehicles categories on our station and just the community picks. That's the stuff I like. Uh, what else do we have? If I want to get into professional modeling and texture, should I go by the book or should I just learn the tricks the professional use to save time? So just to answer, don't go for shortcuts right away. You should learn to do things manually before you want to get into automating and everything. That means if you open Substance Painter, don't texture it with just smart materials from the start. You might do that the first time. Learn how to make those smart materials, understand how they work, understand how to create something completely from scratch. And once you know that, then you should start using the tricks the professional use, because otherwise you're never gonna reach the level that, uh, that they have. So that's an important one to remember. Um, with next gen consoles rumored to have ray tracing, how close to the line do you think we are reaching the detail we, we, where we could emulate or fake the level Quality. I don't think ray tracing real time consoles just now. Probably the next generation. I mean, it works. I've 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 run it on my computer as well. But huge resolutions with 60 FPS being the minimum these days. It's probably going to be another generation before that stuff comes in. But again, I'm not the biggest pro on that. I'm I'm not in the games industry anymore. Don't take my word for it. But that's my uh, my thoughts. Um, how many years of experience do you need to find a job in the game dev industry? Well, zero. There's always entry-level jobs. Don't be discouraged by this. It's more about your portfolio quality than anything else. You don't need to have a degree. You don't necessarily need to have experience. If you've modeled a video game, you've got some stuff out there, you've got a good portfolio, you, you can get a job. Um, there's, there's no nothing stopping you really there. Um, rumor has it Blender is superior to Maya and other paint. Where oh, that's only a question. Um, what are some of the responsibilities of a technical artist, uh, technical character artist in the production? Well, I, I, I don't know if technical character artist is actually a, um, a title, but technical artist, it, it, it differs by studios. But in general, the way I like to see it is you form the link between, oops, you form the link between um, the programmers, the coders, mostly the graphics programmers, and the other artists. So, for example, if the game is running too slow or uh, the game is running too slow, you need to talk to the artist and find a way to get it to run better. So you're going to see if you can't improve their way of making models or if the artists want to achieve a certain level of quality, like the shader doesn't support what they need. You as a technical artist look into what they're after because you, you're supposed to have a better understanding of shaders and the technicalities between it. And then you can bring that across to a, uh, a graphics programmer to improve that. What I also like to do is I like to sit down with people and see how they were working. For example, uh, I remember at DICE, at first people were exporting in Maya by always going to file, export, choose FBX, type the settings, click export, and we go out. And then I would think, okay, this is, we can make this much faster. I can write a script, but they basically have to click one button and it exports completely correctly. And it um, saves people huge amounts of time. Make sure that the pipeline would work better and uh, just makes people's lives easier in general. So you're there to improve people's lives, improve communication, and uh, just make sure everybody can do a better job, really. So a bit of a support role. Um, speaking of Python, are you using Visual Studio or some other uh, software before I shift to Substance? So 
Uh, I like to use, I learned this at DICE, I like to use PyCharm. Uh, there's a free edition called PyCharm Community Edition. This is actually pretty good IDE to, uh, to use. Um, I generally use this for Python. I have used Visual Studio Code as well. Um, that's actually fine too, but I'm just a bit more familiar with, uh, with PyCharm. I, I kind of prefer it a little bit more. So if you want to get into Python, PyCharm Community Edition is, is what I would uh, recommend. Let's see, do we have some more questions? Um, what are my thoughts on Pixel Mixer and using it in the Substance? Ah, that's an interesting one. Uh, maybe I have to be careful what I say here right now. But I think, I think competition is great. Uh, to be honest, um, as soon as Mixer comes out, we look at this and we think, okay, what are they doing? How can we improve? It just makes us uh, a better software as well. Using it in the Substance workflow, um, if that works for you, then that's fine. I think in the end, sometimes people focus too much on um, us versus them and Ma Blender versus Maya and Quixel versus Substance. It's just a tool in the end. If you work faster and get better or the same results in one software, just stick with that. But you got to remember when you go to production to a job, they might ask you to use something else. I came to DICE being a 3ds Max guy and I had to learn Maya. And even though I think maybe that Max is better, um, I still have to use it. So you might be a Quixel fan and have to use Substance or it might be the other way around. Um, that's just the thing. You have to realize it's a tool. And if you're a good artist, then you can work around that. Yes, yes but definitely they have just a larger library. So Substance Painter cannot be changed in this. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think there's a problem with mixing. You take mega scans and use it inside Substance Painter. There's nothing stopping you from, from doing that. Um, I guess, it's, of course, you can't open Substance archives inside Mixer, but you could export them and use them in Mixer if you want, if that's what you're after. There's really nothing stopping you from doing it. It just depends what you're after. There's no right or wrong here. Um, other questions. Tips for making a good portfolio. Uh, that's a good question for IA4AC. I would say... Don't go too wide, and you're only as good as your worst work in there. So you, sometimes you see people that make an environment, they make a vehicle, and then they make a character. And like for characters, often because they're harder, they tend to be pretty bad. So I would just leave that out. Um, start with what you're good at. Focus on something that you know you can do a good job at. Three good pieces is better than five, six mediocre pieces. So um, just focus and only leave in the very best stuff. You can always shift later. I mean, I know of somebody personally who started doing weapons and eventually became a character artist by learning characters in his free time. He became pro weapons and then moved to another area. So it's, it's possible, but focus at first. Um, other question. What is it? Pipeline for texturing hero props and characters. What's important to know to make a proper character stand out? Um, I mean, the pipeline would be you do your base mesh probably in... Um, Max or Maya, move it to ZBrush if it needs organic sculpting, spend quite a lot of time there. And I think especially for hero stuff, key is going to be to create a really good um, normal map or high poly for that. Uh, the better your sculpt is, the better your bevels are, the detail that you add into that, it helps you in texturing as well. Uh, so thinking of the modeling before you even move to the texturing helps with it uh, standing out. Um, I mean, you, you can test it yourself. If you bring in a mesh with a crappy high poly and put a smart material on there, or mesh with a really, really amazing high poly, you, you can see the difference in quality just from using the same smart material there already. So I'd say high poly and sculpting makes a difference there. Uh, next question, is it smart to use UDIMs in a game engine as separate materials on a high poly single model? There's no need for UDIMs in a game engine. Uh, actually, don't take me on this. I, I don't even know if many engines support this yet. Um, you could, of course, always texture with UDIMS in Painter once it comes out, which is going to be soon because we've got a beta already, and use that to have multiple texture sets and go across seams. But um, in an engine, it's essentially not going to make a difference technically even. Both are just going to be two draw calls, two different shaders, so it wouldn't matter that much. Um, question from Kufo. How much time does it usually take for a studio developer to lay on the ropes of a game engine, one that isn't built in-house. Um, so let me read that again. Learn the ropes. Oh, to be honest, it, it depends. Like un Unreal, for example, is pretty easy to get started with. Uh, there's lots of tutorials. When I started working with Frostbite, it took me a little bit longer. But in the end, the engine usually isn't 
biggest block to get across. I thought it was harder to learn how to use Maya coming from Max than to use Frostbite, for example, when I came from um, from Unreal. Um, so the engine usually isn't really the big stumbling block. Um, Maya for AC yeah, should I only focus on Art Station? Stand out. Uh, to be honest, there's so much on Art Station, but if you can look at other sites, for sure do it. But I think there's so much on days that I would just stick with that uh, if, if, if that's what your area is. Um, there might be other ones, for example, I know Behance, but that's not really game and, and movie focused. It's more like design and that type of stuff. You could look at that as well. But reference and then inspiration can come from anywhere. So you don't have to focus on the site. Um, Boyan is asking, is it easy to find uh, Depends. Some countries, some places, it's harder. In my native Belgium, there's not so many jobs, so I had to move abroad as well. Um, but the better you are, the better your portfolio is, the easier it is to, to find a job. And of course, you can always start small and smaller companies local that might not be so cool or impressive and move on later. I mean, that's, it's true for anything, even if you're not in games. Don't expect to get your dream job at first. Just start small, build it up, and maybe after 10 years, you get an amazing job. Um, okay, I think... Yes, most of them are, were answered, and we are out of time now. So That's nice. Thanks, Lawrence, for being our speaker today, and hopefully we can see you next year. All right, I hope so. Yeah, I hope to be there in person. Thanks, everyone. Good to see so many people on this live stream. First time I do this, so I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, maybe see you next year. <laughs>